One year ago, tragedy on Table Rock Lake. And um, it became clear that this is, this is no rescue. This is going to be uh, a recovery. During this hour-long special, what first responders saw when they arrived on scene. The look of terror on his face, because he had just been involved and witnessed all that. And that, that's something that I will never forget. The vivid memories from hospital staff. There was moms and dads looking for their children. There were children looking for their moms and dads. We were anticipating receiving a large amount of patients, but we did not. And the reason why was because so many had drowned. 17 people lost their lives when the death boat sank during a storm. After my patient found out that his, his mom and his brother um, were confirmed deceased, uh, he wanted to tell me about the story of when the day that his brother was born. An investigation still underway today. And all of a sudden, the whole world was watching Branson. What's been done over the past year? Coming up on Color 10 News. Thank you for tuning in at 6. You're joining us live near the Branson Bell on Table Rock Lake. It is the same place where 17 people died exactly a year ago today when a duck boat capsized on rough waters there. Good evening, everyone. I'm Joe Morano. And I'm Crystal Blair. Tonight we look back at what exactly happened last summer when a quick moving storm rolled in and tragically took the lives of several family members. But we're also looking forward at the lessons learned from this terrible accident. We have team coverage coming for you over the course of the next hour. Our Jesse Inman is in Branson at Cox Medical Center. Over the last several months, we spoke with a number of first responders and workers who worked that night and shared their memories their heartbreaking memories of this tragic accident. We'll hear from Jesse in a moment. Plus, Heather Lewis is in our Color 10 studio with a preview of what you can expect during this one hour special on the Duck Bolt tragedy. Heather? Well, Crystal, we have a lot of material to cover in the next 60 minutes. Tonight, not only will you hear the stories of several key witnesses who saw the boat go down, but we'll also give you the latest details on the criminal charges and investigation into the sinking of Stretch Duck 7. We're also going to check in with state and local lawmakers on what's being done to prevent tragedies like this from ever happening again. Plus, we'll fill you in on where dozens of civil lawsuits stand against the company that owned the duck boat, Ripley Entertainment. Finally, one major aspect of this anniversary is how people are dealing with the mental trauma of an event like this today. Many organizations like Cox Health have now added counselors to manage people's emotions. That's just a small taste of everything we have tonight. Joe and Crystal, I'll send it back to you. All right, thank you, Heather. As we begin tonight, we look back. One year ago, there were many who were on scene that watched the horror of this tragedy unfold. That's right. So we want you to listen now as some of those who tried to help recall what they saw, felt, heard, and feared that fateful night. You know, that July 19th, that evening, uh, I was actually at home. I, did, I did, was not on call as a chief officer. And uh, we got paged, and I was listening. I always listen to the pages, but I was listening to it, and they paged our water rescue team and uh, for a capsized duck with uh, 30 people in the water. And I think it was pretty clear to everybody right off the get-go that it's going to be a major event. When I arrived on scene that night, uh, the thing I vividly remember, it was, it was complete chaos. The biggest thing that I had a real hard time understanding is we had victims from the, the duck sitting there, a very small number. And I knew how many had went to the hospital already. And my biggest obstacle in my mind I couldn't come over is where was the rest of them? Our initial response was we sent one ambulance and a supervisor. Uh, during their response out there before they ever got on scene, we started receiving more reports, and then we uh, started receiving reports directly from the showboat, uh, so almost firsthand reports that it was a duck boat, that uh, we were looking at potentially upwards of 30 to 35 people. At that point, uh, we initiated our mass casualty response plan. When they got on there, they, uh, they quickly realized uh, how, how devastating the scene was potentially going to be. Uh, they found several patients in cardiac arrest with CPR in progress. 
uh, and then more and more reports that uh, someone else had been pulled ashore. We, we didn't realize just how many people either needed minimal treatment, no treatment, or were dead. Uh, and that's, that was highly unusual. And then uh, some people were pulled out of the water that were not, that were not alive. And you know, at the very end it turned out we had um, obviously the seven, 17 fatalities. That's obviously a very high number of fatalities. We had several people, but I was expecting a lot more people. Um, it was unfortunate that we had more that passed away that made it, then made it to the hospital for us to care for, and that's always a difficult um, thing to swallow. You know, we're, we're in the job of helping and saving lives, and when there's not that many to save, it's, it makes for a very difficult day. We were anticipating receiving a large amount of patients, but we did not. And the reason why was because so many had drowned. And that was very just, it was just very saddening for us. Once we knew that we had unattended minors, um, as the patients were rolling in, we realized that some of them didn't have adults with them. Then we had to work on getting staff members to stay available to sit with those patients so that they weren't alone. At one point, he, after my patient found out that his, his mom and his brother um, were confirmed deceased, uh, he wanted to tell me about the story of when the day that his brother was born. So as emotional as it was, he told me that story, and all I needed to do in that moment was just to sit and listen. I couldn't wrap my head around it at all. Um, just the initial thought of the, the duck boat capsizing you know, just trying to figure out what was going on. And then when the, uh, the numbers started coming in, it was just sobering and, and so staggering that you just couldn't wrap your head around it. Now, as you just heard, 17 souls were taken by the storm that night. Then afterwards, the boat was lifted out of the bottom of the lake and taken out of the water. Days after the tragedy came memorials and funerals for those victims. 31 people in total were on that boat, including two crewmen. Many of them were families that were torn apart. Some made it out of the water and some did not. That's right. The Stone County Sheriff's Office released the names of the deceased the day after William Asher and Rosemary Haman were visiting from St. Louis. Janice and William Bright from Higginsville were celebrating their 45th wedding anniversary. Their three daughters survived. Leslie Dennison from Illinois died. Her granddaughter made it off the boat. Lance and his father, Steve Smith, from Osceola, Arkansas, passed away. His daughter survived and wife was back on shore during that ride. And nine members of the Coleman family were killed on the boat, including three children. The mother, Tia, plus a young boy lived. And finally, the duck boat captain, Bob Williams, died. Now, fast forward to today. What have we learned from this tragedy over the last year? How could something like this could have happened? And who was responsible? There are still a lot of questions. Tonight, we hope to provide you with some answers. We want to start off by getting an update of the current NTSB investigation that's still going on from this accident from a year ago. And for that, we check in for the first time with Jesse Enman from Cox Medical Center in Branson. Jesse, good evening. Yeah, good evening to you, Joe and Crystal. We reached out to a spokesperson for the NTSB who told us, plain and simple, the investigation is still ongoing. Now, an official report of what caused Stretch Duck 7 to sink may not be released until this fall. And a week after the incident last July, the NTSB released a preliminary report, and in that, details it detailed on board what was what we were really looking at on board multiple cameras were on board that duck boat and it recorded video and audio for about 41 minutes plus dozens of cell phones witness interviews and weather data are also being reviewed now as of today three people have been indicted by a federal grand jury for crimes related to the sinking of that duck boat the three employees facing charges all worked for ripley entertainment we're talking about Kenneth McKee here from Verona, was one of the boat captains on Stretch Duck, Stretch Duck 7 who survived the accident that night. He's facing 17 charges of negligence and misconduct. Now, state attorneys claim McKee failed to do the following. 
failed to assess severe weather before entering the water, instruct passengers to put on flotation devices, raise the boat's side curtains, which blocked the emergency exits, and finally failed to order an abandoned ship call on that. Now, another aspect of the crimes were the radio calls back and forth to shore. And that's where Curtis Lanham from Galena and Charles Baltzell of Kirbyville come into play here. They face dozens of charges surrounding the supervision of the duck boat that night. The indictment says that Baltzell directed the vessel into the water with lightning in the area and didn't communicate the nature of the storm. Meanwhile, Lanham helped manage the operation of the duck boats and he's accused of failing to establish and enforce severe weather training requirements, also allowing the boat to operate out of compliance with Coast Guard inspections. And court documents also say that Lanham created a work environment that promoted profit over safety by not hiring enough staff to monitor situations just like this. And we all remember it so well. But right now, as far as the criminal charges, that's the latest that we have on this incident. Of course, with that wrapping up here in the fall, we'll definitely be keeping up with that. Joe and Crystal. All right, Jesse Inman this morning, thank you so much. We're just getting started here on Taken by Storm. Up next, we remember some of the survivors from this tragedy. I've never had to recover from something like this. I don't know if there is a recovery from it. I don't know. I'm going to do it. You may remember Tia Coleman, who lost nine members of her family, including her own children. We'll update you on her ongoing legal battle, including the battles of other people who lost family members and are suing Ripley. Please stay with us. Welcome back. 19 out of 33 lawsuits have been settled in one of those cases. Is Tia Coleman. Now, her settlement agreement terms were not disclosed, but she did initially sue Ripley for $100 million last year. And Joe, Tia was actually supposed to be on another boat that night. Our Frances Lynn retells her story and a woman who met her at the hospital. And then it got really choppy and big swells of water start coming into the boat. The last thing I heard my sister-in-law yell was, grab the baby. And I said, Jesus, please keep, keep me. Just keep me so I can get to my children. Keep me, Lord. And I was swimming. I was swimming as fast as I could. And I couldn't reach, I could not reach the life jackets. And I just remember I kept sinking. I kept sinking. And, and finally I said, Lord, just let me die. Let me die. I said, I can't, I can't keep drowning. I just can't keep drowning because that's how I felt. And then I just let go and I started floating. I was floating up to the top. Tia was then taken to Cox Health Hospital. There was moms and dads looking for their children. There were children looking for their moms and dads. Brandy Clifton, communications manager at Cox Health, recalls the two days after the accident when Tia wanted to meet her kids and play with them. She was smiling and laughing and what we wrapped up the conversation and I was going back to my car and I was putting them in their car seats and my 12 year old said mom do you realize that we are the exact same ages as the three that she lost I just thinking about that to that day like here I am I get to go home and make supper and I've got all three of them with me the whole gang and she has not she's nothing she lost it all in just a moment and so I think about that all the time and she, she, what, for whatever reason, that day, she needed to see them. I saw things that are going to haunt me, and I heard conversations that are going to stick with me. And that's okay. That's okay. And so I think revisiting and remembering, being grateful for what we have, I think everyone that you would talk to from that day says, you know, I went home and I hugged my wife, or I went home and I, and I kissed my kids. That's, that's, that's so important. And as I watched my kids grow, I told Tia that I would never forget her and I would think of her always. And I, I will. I'm losing an entire family on vacation. Like, you can't fix that. That was our Frances Lynn reporting. Several other families alongside Tia Coleman have also filed lawsuits against Ripley Entertainment including some who made it out of the duck boat alive. That's right. For that, we want to check back in with Heather Lewis in our Color 10 studios for more details. Heather. 
Yeah, Joe and Crystal, there was actually another family of nine from New Mexico who all survived the duck boat capsizing. In fact, the same law firm that represented the Coleman's helped that family also reach a settlement. We know the family of a St. Louis man, William Asher, has settled, and the family of Janice and William Bright from Higginsville were the first to settle in November of last year. However, there are still 14 cases in negotiations or plan to have mediation in the future. To add to those, there are other lawsuits against Ride the Ducks International involving products liability. Several law firms are arguing the duck boats were designed with flaws and didn't make changes recommended by the NTSB after other similar accidents. That includes the sinking of a duck boat in Hot Springs, Arkansas in 1999. That killed 13 people. However, those cases are waiting for a judge to determine whether or not Table Rock Lake is a navigable waterway. The reason for that, a section of maritime law that dates back to 1851. It determines whether or not the manufacturers of the duck boats could be liable. If so, the families could seek additional damages. Color 10 reached out to Ripley Entertainment for its response. The company didn't want to go on camera, but released this statement, which says in part, quote, not a day has passed that we don't think about those who lost their lives and their families. We know we can never fully understand the pain, but we've worked hard to offer help wherever we can. We are deeply committed to supporting these families. A recent court filing outlines the settlements we have reached with many of the families, and we continue to work with others. Joe and Crystal, back to you. All right, thank you, Heather. Still to come on Taken by Storm, people on the Branson Bell from that night also don't forget what they saw. It was the most tragic thing I have witnessed because you, you felt so helpless. You just couldn't do anything but watch. Hear the story of this 90-year-old woman who had just sat down for dinner that night. And plus, Senator Hawley wants to make duck boats safer. All of that when we come back. You're joining us again live from Table Rock Lake, and as you can see, the waters are calm right now. But one year ago, the waters whipped up and over the windows of the duck boat and tragically sank it. Earlier this year, the Kansas City Star reported that boat's original bilge pump meant to help drain the water was replaced for smaller, less powerful ones. Similar boats had issues with their pumps in the past, but another boat on the water that night actually made it back to shore. Federal authorities continue to investigate whether or not the bilge pumps played a role in this accident. A year ago today, dozens of people saw the duck boat struggling in the water right here at the showboat Branson Bell. One of those witnesses was 90-year-old Pat Styron. And actually, one of her granddaughters is a producer with us here at Color 10, and she was one of the first people to let us know about this accident. John Adams brings us her story tonight. The captain of the ship came through and said, the boat's down, the boat's down, duck boat's down. Oh, those poor people. Styron and the others on board could see the duck boat struggling to make it back to shore through the window of the bell. The second one we could see was in trouble. It was kind of going up and down in the water. The crew of the showboat sprang into action, many of them jumping into the water to try to save those on the ducks. Styron watched as they were able to pull some individuals out of the lake in the pouring rain. I remember one boy. He looked like a teenager. They got him up and he was laying down on the, on the boat and uh, then they pronounced him dead, and it was so heartbreaking. The images of that tragic day haunted Styron for weeks. My heart was broken. I just couldn't, I kept seeing it when I came home. And she still remembers it vividly today. I still have a picture in my mind of, of uh, the water and the boat going down and knowing there were people in it and seeing those people trying to get to safety. It's kind of like a nightmare. Styron says she hopes that measures are put in place so a tragedy like this never happens again. Reporting from Table Rock Lake, John Adams, Ozarks First. And here we are 12 months after this tragedy. Some people still have the question, what about the future of duck boats on Table Rock Lake? Well, our Jesse Emman joins us live to explain. 
Yeah, guys, so Ripley Entertainment has stated that they have no plans to put boats on the water in 2019 or after 2019 either. But if they did, they would have a 90 day notice to let the Attorney General's office know about that. And they have vowed to stop that operation. Plus, Missouri Senator Josh Hawley has plans of his own to make duck boats safer. So I've introduced legislation that would not only require the duck boats to implement all of the safety recommendations that the National Transportation Safety Board has been recommending for literally years, but would go above and beyond that by requiring them to pay attention to the National Weather Service warnings, would not permit them to go out on the water if there is a storm warning in effect, and would also require a safety inspection every time before every on-water tour uh, to make sure that these boats are safe. Now, Holly's bill is still in committee, and it also calls for more bilge pumps, boat buoyancy, as well as uh, removable canopies for that. Now, coming up in our next half hour, we're going to turn our attention to what it was like for employees of Cox Hospital right behind me here. Stick around for that. You'll hear for stories of several Cox Branson employees from that night and how they're still dealing with trauma today. Plus, when we return, David Oliver and Heather Lewis join us back in our Color 10 studio. Stay with us.